Well, good morning, everybody. I don't know if you caught that there was Dan Donuts today. Did anybody notice? There's like one left. I'm, I'm claiming it. No, you didn't get a donut. I just, in Iowa, there's no Dan Donuts, and so it's one of the things I, I miss. And I don't know why this keeps happening, but for some reason, at least 50% of the time I'm here, I wear the same stinking color shirt as Dave. <laughs> we do not plan this. In fact, I try, to, I try to think what color is he going to wear so that I don't wear it. But it doesn't, uh, doesn't always work out that way. And uh, obviously Pete's not here today, so we're taking a pause from the Fruit of the Spirit. And uh, he'll pick that back up next week. Now, I know that Jen was trying to surprise him for their anniversary. I don't know if she's been able to pull that off, so uh, you might, uh, you might uh, investigate and, and uh, find out next week whether uh, uh, Pete cooperated or not. But it is so good to be with you. Listen, this, just this uh, past week I found out that I am getting older than I thought. I know that I'm getting older because I feel it, because you know you're getting older when you get up out of the chair and you grunt. So, I mean, that happens. But, but here's the deal. I thought that even though my body is wearing down, that I, I'm still a pretty hip dad. But apparently not. I, uh, I led a, uh, a staff retreat for a church in Iowa just over a week ago. And I made a TV reference to a TV show in the late 90s. Is, how many of you, show of hands, are familiar with the, the TV show Everybody Loves Raymond? Okay, so, so how many of you have, have no idea clue what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. So only, only a few. <laughs> so, so that blank look that you got, that's the, that's the look that I got when I made that reference. Had two, two of the young men at the retreat just looked at me like, like I just referenced Ozzy and Harriet or, uh, or Archie Bunker. I mean, I think about that. How many of you know who Archie Bunker is? <laughs> he would not make it on TV today, would he? But when I looked at those blank faces looking back at me, they had no idea what I was talking about. It was then I realized I am not as hip as I thought I was. I, I need to do some work on updating my references. And I have no idea when I lost my hipness. Because believe me, I used to have hair. And I used to look cool. Because when I was in high school, I had this awesome Miami Vice Don Johnson suit. And mine wasn't white. Mine was plum purple. I, I was cooler than him. And then at a younger age, I remember in grade school, I had these parachute pants and matching jacket with zippers all over it. It was kind of a cross between... Michael Jackson and, it, and MC Hammer. And I thought I was just as cool as them. And the first day of school that I wore that cool outfit with all these zippers that went to nowhere, the first day I wore that, I tore the knee out of it playing, uh, playing a dodgeball in gym. I had to go home and throw the pants away. I had no idea that one day torn pants would be, would be cool again. <laughs> I could have kept them and I'd have been all right. But I try to stay hip, I try to stay up to date, mostly so that I can relate to my sons. My boys are still in high school, but it is tough. It is hard to keep up. It is hard to stay, stay cool, especially with my youngest. I'll embarrass him since he's here today, because I don't get him sometimes. He will wear a sweatshirt in the middle of summer and shorts in the middle of winter. And I'm like, what, what is wrong with you, boy? But I can't, I can't complain about either of my sons because they are far from these radical hipsters, you know, teenagers. In fact, I hate to admit this because one of my sons is here. If I, if I was to be honest with myself, I was probably a little more radical in my hipness when I was their age. They're probably more conservative than, than I was, and I hate admit, admitting that, but it's true. But there's one form of radical that I want my sons to be, that I want 
your sons and daughters to be, that I want us all to be. And that's what we're going to talk about is this radical living. And when I say radical, I don't mean radical in the terms of, hey, look at me, see how cool and hip and different I am to draw attention to me. No, the, the, word, the word, the definition we're going with radical today is just a radically different lifestyle that doesn't draw attention to me, but draws attention to God. And so when we look at, uh, we walk through this radical living today, we understand this is what, this is not what Jason is calling you to. It's not what Jerome Christian Church is calling you to. This is what God calls us to. From the very beginning, God had established that his people should live radical lives. Their, their lives should look radically different than that of the world. And so we're going to look at two expectations that God has for us so that we can live, live out these, uh, these radical lives throughout our lives from, from a young age to an old age. And, there's, and we're going to look at two of them today. And the first one is this, radical standards. God has set forth radical standards. We look in the scripture and we see these standards. And what, is the, what comes to mind when we think about God's radical standards or, or his standards at, at all? I think one of the first things that comes to mind is maybe, maybe the Ten Commandments. I mean, we, we, look at the, we look at these thou shall nots and, these, and thou shall do this, thou shall not do this. And we think, well, that's, that's just kind of the basis of our Judeo-Christian faith. But no, this is a, these are radical standards that God, God set forth for the nation of Israel from the very beginning because they were to be a priestly, holy nation set apart from the world. And through living by and establishing these standards, they were, they were to look different, but not in such a way that they drew attention to themselves, but they drew attention to God. Now we look at these, we know the Ten Commandments, we're familiar with them, and, and we might look at these and we think, these are not, these are not that radical. If we, were, if we were alive back then, the whole concept of that there is only one God and worshiping only one God, that was a radical standard. Very radical, because there were many gods. So worshiping one was a, was a radical standard at that time. But even today we look at this and we think, maybe, maybe it's really not that radical. I've grown, I've grown up reading about them. We've studied them. But they are radical. If they're not radical, then why does our culture keep trying to remove them from public view? You thought about that? What is so radical about these standards of God? You know, what's the, what, is the, what is the big deal? So what? Every religion has their list of do's and don'ts. What's so special about the Ten Commandments? Well, here's what's special about them. They're not just standards. They're the radical minimum standard of what it is to be a child of God. In fact, here's really the kicker. We look at these as kind of the, the basis of our faith. This is kind of where it began. But I don't think that's how, what God, God thought of when, when he established these. Think about, think about this. It starts with, I am the Lord your God. Basically, God says, hey, I'm your God. I'm the one who created you. And then he tells Moses, he lays out this list of, and this is how I created you to live. So, Think of this as the radical minimum standard of what it means to be human, a human child of God. And you think, you think this, and you, you might be asking, you mean this is just a minimum standard? This isn't something we're supposed to be shooting for? No, this is the, this is the baseline, because think about this. If we fast forward into the New Testament, Jesus, Jesus seems to take this to another, another level. Think about this. Jesus says, hey... You've heard it said, do not murder. But then he says what? I tell you, don't, don't hold hate in your heart for your brother, right? So okay. It's not too bad. I get it. But then he goes on. He says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But Jesus says, I tell you, you know, don't even look at a woman lustfully in your heart. Like, Can you imagine that audience? Like, Calm down, Jesus. Slow your roll. You're getting a little carried away here. But he doesn't stop. Here's a scripture. He goes on to say, 
You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Then here's, here's this last line. Here's the kicker. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Man, that's a pretty high standard, is it not? I mean, he is calling, he's calling us to live this radical, radical life with high standards. And then Paul comes along. And he says, hey, if you're going to be a follower of Christ, a spirit-filled one, what have, what is, what's Pete been going through? You've got to look a lot more fruitier than you are. And we have this list of love, joy, peace, patience. And it seems like, especially if you're reading the scriptures for the first time, as you read from the Old Testament and the New, that God just, just keeps raising the standards. So does he? Is that, is that what God has done? Is he, has he raised the standards too high? Are God's two standards too, too high for us? Should God be more reasonable? Maybe lower them a little bit? Some Christians think, some Christians think so. Let's, let's lower the standards. Let's make them smaller. And they twist the word of God and lower the standards until it gets to the point to where the standard's so low, can you, can you make out the standard anymore, if there is any? Does God need to get with the times? You know, I keep hearing, in fact, I will admit, I've been one of these voices that have said occasionally, the temptations that this generation face are greater than any generation's ever faced. I mean, you think about with our dumb phones and the internet, and how poisonous and dangerous it can be. Maybe, maybe we can make an argument that this generation is facing you know, the greater temptations than the other uh, generation has faced. Maybe we can make that argument. But is the answer to lower the standard? I mean, think about it. Tell me what organization, what group, what institution, what team, what family has ever lowered the standards and things got better. Can you think of one example? Think about this. Humanity has proven time and time again that if you lower the standards, they will meet them every time. Will we not? Listen, I don't want you to start thinking that we're looking, God's looking for a certain standard because God's not, God's not looking for a certain standard for you to live by. He's looking for a relationship. And when you think about that, it makes sense because what do we do as parents? We set standards for our kids because we want a relationship with them. We have certain guidelines and values and behaviors that we, that we expect of them because we want a relationship with them. In fact, we want a healthy relationship with them and we want them to one day have a healthy relationship with others so that they leave our house and become productive citizens of society and our culture and of God's kingdom. That's what we want, right? God's not about these standards. He's about relationships. And I was thinking about this the other day, the hopes and dreams I have for my children, for our church. And it was about a month or so ago, my girls... Um, my, my girls are in college, Maria and Annie. Maria is my oldest, she's 23, and Annie's 21. So my whole family is together, and that doesn't happen very often unless it's the holidays. And so I decided I'm going I'm to plan a special trip. We're, we're going to go take a kayaking trip. And then I decided well, what I was going to do, I was going to do something that I've been wanting to do for a long time. I just hadn't had the opportunity. Because Sherry and I, I mean, like any other parent, we have certain guidelines and, and rules of the house, but throughout our, our family's life, I have tried to make it to a point to establish four family Christian values. 
And these aren't just Christian values. They're height family, fish, they're height family Christian values. So these four values are what it means to be a, a son or a daughter of Jason and Sherry Height, followers of Jesus Christ. And so I started thinking, you know, my kids are out of the house, started getting worried that maybe these values haven't caught on. And so I decided I'm going to raise the standards. And so we are on this uh, kayaking trip. Halfway through, we hit this uh, little sandbar, this little um, sandy little island in the middle of the river. And as, I, as we kind of wandered around, I got them all together, and I walked them through. Um, I, I took a stick, and I drew out in the sand, and made, the, made this X, because the, the X stands for the cross. And I just wrote out those four family values. And they're like, yeah, Dad, that's cool. But no, here's the kicker. Here's where I really raised the value. I got four kids, so I assigned each one of my children a value. And I asked them, challenged them, take this value with you for the next year and make it your mantra. Now, what I failed to tell you is that this was on a Sunday. Because the only time we could book was on a Sunday and everybody's schedule come together. And it was a Sunday morning, so it meant, yes, the preacher skipped church that day. And I, was, I, I wasn't wanting to do it, but, but I decided the best investment that I could make for my family that day was to skip church. But we didn't skip church because dad snuck communion in his cooler. And so we didn't just walk through these family values. We walked, to, we walked through them, challenged them with them, and then we had communion. We had church right there in the middle of the river. It was a radical way to do church. But in order to pass on our family values, our radical standards, I knew I, ne- I, knew I needed to make a radical investment. And that's the second expectation that God has of his people, that we live by these radical standards, but we also make radical investments into other people's lives. And I think, I think this church does a very good job of, about it. But think about how Jesus invested in us. I mean, Jesus, Jesus wasn't just beamed down to earth, right? He didn't just come as a full-grown man and then just make his way to the cross, did the grave, and then said, you know, see you later. You guys take it from here. No, he came as a baby in the manger, and he grew up amongst humanity. He invested his life into humanity. And then those three years of ministry, investing and pouring himself into those disciples. And then after his death and resurrection, before he leaves, he says, listen, I got to go because I've got further investment I want to make. I I want to bring the Holy Spirit, not just to you, but to to everyone. And we see that happen. We open up the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, we read about the day of Pentecost, and it says all the apostles were filled with the Spirit. And then Peter preached. You have this just, just... Awesome moment in church history. And then what happens? It says 3,000 were added to their number that day. You remember that? That's how it began. And, And the church has been a force to reckon with ever since that day. Listen, if you don't know any of your church history, you've got you to gotta realize that the church has always been a, been a pioneering force for things like education and health care and hospitals and orphanages. All of, the, all of the needs of humanity. The church has always been there, the front lines, trying to invest in God's people, invest in God's kingdom. And this is, this is one of the things that has impressed me about Jerome. This is one of the biggest reasons why I am here a part of your church family. Because I've been so impressed with how you invest in God's kingdom. Did you know that, that out of everything that, sh- that you give in tithes and offerings, 20, at least 22% goes to missions, missions here and abroad? I mean, that blew me away when I heard that. It's like, okay, I want to be a part of a church that's doing that. Because there are very few churches that can pull that off. And then I remember uh, this summer I wasn't able to attend. It was like right after you had the county fair. 
got the little white church. I still haven't seen the little white church. But you had the golf cart. And you're just, just investing that week into your community. And I thought, man, that's going to be so much fun next summer when I'm here to do that. And I think about things like the preschool and the Kids Hope Mentoring Program and how, how well you guys are just in, committed to investing into this community. And this doesn't even, uh, not to mention all of you who are invested in the school system, whether you're employed or volunteered. I mean, we have a lot of people from Jerome who are invested in our community and our school system. And it, and it blows me away. I'm so excited about it. I'm so proud to be a part of Jerome Christian Church. I'm so proud of how we invest into our community and to God's kingdom. And listen, I think the best is yet to come. I really do. I hope you do too. But I want to challenge you today. I want you to challenge you because I, I want to challenge you to something even more difficult. Because it is, it is challenging to love your neighbor or even your enemies, right? But maybe like me, you have bought in to the misconception that loving your neighbor is one of the hardest things that you do. That is not true. Yes, it is difficult to love those who don't love you, but we don't live with our neighbor every day. If you did, they are no longer your neighbor. Man, we finally got some good neighbors this, this uh, past year who actually talked to us and waved to us. And we enjoy having them, but we don't live life with them. So I want you to think about this. Think about how well you love one another. Because loving your family, loving your church family, can be one of the hardest things that you can do. Because it's day in and day out. Personalities clash. Feelings get hurt. Lives get messy. It can be hard to love one another. And if you think that, no, it's not that bad loving one another, then why did Jesus give us this command? If, if, it is, if it isn't difficult to love one another, why did Jesus say, I give you this command, a new command, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples. If what? If you love one another. You see, sometimes our love for others outside the church, it can be easier because it's usually shorter. Outreach events, praying for missionaries, sending them money, going on a mission trip, that can be a lot of work, a lot of planning, a lot of energy, but guess what? A lot of those times, a lot of those moments, you're just in and out. And they do take a lot of planning, they do take a lot of energy. But if that is where you put most of your energy and most of your efforts, and you eventually will wear out. But healthy churches, listen to me now. Healthy churches, they do it differently. They love, they love from the inside out, consistently, year after year, generation after generation. They love from the inside out. They heed these words of Christ. That first you love one another so that you have the energy to love others. And even love your enemies. If you find it difficult to love your neighbors or even your enemies, then the first thing you need to do is check how you're loving one another. You know that, that kayaking trip that I took uh, just over a month ago with my family, um, everyone was in a kayak except for me. I was in a canoe because I had this brilliant idea that we should take our black Labrador with us. <laughs> Hindsight, I should have bought a life preserver for my dogs. I think they make those, don't they? Next time, that's what will happen if there is a nest next time. But our lab is different in that she's afraid of water. It's weird, I know. But I thought, this will be a good experience. She'll be with me there in the canoe. And we are five minutes in. Everything is fine. We're getting ready to hit, you know, just these small rapids. It's just faster moving water than we're at. And my lab, Ruthie, she decides to jump out of the canoe. And 
she experiences for the very first time what it is to donkey paddle. But she's doing it lousy, just, just chomping at the water, and I can see she's panicking a little bit. I began to panic, and so I'm trying to maneuver my, my canoe into place, and I'm trying to figure out how am I going to get this lab, because they're not small dogs, into the canoe without us both going into the river. But she's, com- she's, she's coming for Dad, and I got a hold of her, and lo and behold, it was just, just got her in, no problem. The boat didn't tip, and I thought, well, hey, I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty good at this. I did not realize, I did not realize that my 21-year-old daughter, Annie, had paddled over with her kayak and got a hold of my canoe and stabilized it so dad didn't go under two. But listen, that's what the church is supposed to do. When you've got someone in trouble, we paddle up next to them, we help secure their craft until everybody is back in the boat and everything is safe and normal again. That's what we do. That's how we love one another. And so... I want to take you to our main scripture today, even though we're about done. How, how has God asked us to do this? How did the church first practice loving one another? Through making these radical investments, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone who was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property, possessions to give to anyone who was in need, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Stop. Everything up to this point, they've done together. They've loved one another. And now, since all of this has happened, now what happens? People have seen these high radical standards. Man, they really love one another. I want to be a part of that. And not only do these people, they want to be saved, they want to be a part of the church as well. Now all of the church, they have the energy to reach out and to love their neighbor and to bring others to Christ. These are the areas that the the first church invested in, right here. These are the areas that healthy churches invest in. And so we here at Jerome, while we're still trying to get our feet back on the ground from COVID, just like many other churches, I want I want to ask you something. I want you to take a look at these areas. In fact, right here. These four areas. Biblical teaching. Are you investing in learning God's word? Not just by yourself, but with others. Because that's how you love others. You're not just going to learn by yourself. You can be in a Sunday school class or looking to join in a small group and love others. That that learning God's word isn't just a a, a you and God thing. It's a you and us thing. It's one of the ways that we love one another. Prayer. Are you invested in praying for and with your church family? Yeah, you hear the prayer request on Sunday mornings. You might get an email. But are are you actually praying with your church family? Because listen, that's how the church loves one another. Fellowship. Are you investing in the lives of the many? You stick around, enjoy some pork. Smells good. I was just in the kitchen. I mean, that's fun to do, but what about this? Investing in the few. Do you have a smaller group here? Whether you're in a small group or not, do you have a small group here that you're connected with and you're investing in each other's lives? That's how we love one another. And then finally, worship. Are you investing your resources, giving of your time and talents? Because that's how We love each other and we love God. So think about it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. What a radical standard. The fruit of the spirit. Radical standard. It starts with love. Greatest commandment, God says, is to love God and love others. And Jesus comes along and says, love your enemies. And we're like, Jesus, you're taking it way too far. The standard's too high. But Jesus didn't raise the standard. Because listen, church, the standard has always been love. Jesus didn't raise the standard. It was always love. And so, church, as you follow Christ and love God with all your heart, don't forget 
to love your one another so that you have the energy to love others, love your neighbor. God shows us that this radical, this radical life, it happens this way. We live out these radical standards of love by making radical investments of love into first one another so that we can love others. And I want you to think about, I want you to take this challenge. Consider, consider God's high standard of love. And not just loving your neighbor, but I want you to, to think about these four areas that we just read there in Acts. And make sure as you go through those, those lists that you are loving one another so that we can continue to do what Jerome does, in it, which is radically invest in God's kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, we see some pretty weird behavior these days. And I know that some of it upsets me, even though I don't have no relationships with some of the weird behavior we see in public and on TV. But Father, I think as a, as a church as a whole, we need to ask for forgiveness because our own behavior is supposed to be a little weird to the world. We're not supposed to look like the world. We get caught up in our busy, busyness, our responsibilities, and we forget that we're supposed to live radically different not in a way that points to ourselves, but points to you, your son, our savior. So Father, thank you for the hearts of uh, Jerome Church. I thank you for their heart for investing in God's kingdom. But let us, as we can kind of continue to regroup from, from COVID, let us not forget that if we truly want to move forward in a healthy way, we cannot forget any area of the life of the church in loving one another. So convict our hearts. Help us with our, our schedules and our times so that we can make loving one another a priority. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. That's how I'm going to put these four areas back up on the screen. And I'm going to ask you to be in prayer during our invitation song. If you have any other decision that you will need to make, then I encourage you to do so. But think about these four areas. As they were doing all four. You might think, well, I've got one, so I'm good. That's not how it works. So look at, look at, at this with the Lord during this uh, invitation time. And if you have a decision to make, then don't just do it quietly by yourself. If you have a spouse or a friend, say, hey, you know what? God spoke to me today. Now, Jason, God spoke to me today, and I need to start loving better in this area. All right, so do that uh, um, as we, uh, do we stand during this song? I can't remember. All right, go ahead and stand and come as we sing.